I'm hitting the wards with my ouch bleeper. Because we've brought ouch and about inside the hospital. Wow. That's the sun, that's the sun. And I'm hitting the streets to answer your medical mysteries. In the hospital canteen, Chris has his first call. A question. Right, I better go. It's from Lydia, who is recovering from brain surgery to help cure her epilepsy. Hi, Lydia. How are you? Good. Very nice to see you. You had a question for me. Yeah. How long does it take for stitches in my head to dissolve? Well, what's the diagnosis, Doc? Sounds like a case of how long does it take the stitches in my head to dissolve itis. Ha <laughs> ha! Lydia's in stitches. Well, they should take about 10 days to two weeks, but sometimes the stitches can take up to six weeks to dissolve fully. Shall we have a look with the ouch cam? Yeah. OK, so Lydia, I'll put that there. And then you can see the screen. Look away if you're squeamish. So the little black line to your hair and the black bit is a scab. It's just creepy. You know what, Lydia? I can't see any stitches at all. So I think that your stitches, they're already starting to dissolve. That's actually quite cool. OK, Lydia, well, you have earned yourself an Operation Out sticker. A oh, sticker. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Unlike Dr Chris, I don't have a fancy bleeper out here. How will I know when someone has a question? Dr Zahns! Oh, have you got a question for me? Yes. Why can my shoulder blade stick out? Wow! So what you have is things called winged scapulars. Your scapulars, your shoulder blade, and they're, they're called wings because they, they come out a bit like wings on you, which is amazing. Normally, you have a muscle called serratus anterior, and that muscle goes under the shoulder blade and holds it onto your back. And for some reason in you, it isn't doing that, which means you can do this amazing thing, which is flap your shoulder blades. I've never seen that before. Well, thanks very much for showing me your amazing back. Bye. Bye. Amazing. Meanwhile, my ouch bleeper's busily beeping. Get a wriggle on, Chris. It's Harry, who has a condition which means he has trouble eating. Hello, Dr Chris. How are you? Fine. What is your question? What is an esophagitis? That is a very good question. Well, what's the diagnosis, Doc? But I think it sounds like you have a case of... I want to know if Dr Chris knows what an esophagitis is... itis. Ooh, a double itis. Do you know that an esophagus is the tube that links your mouth to your stomach? So, whenever something in your body is inflamed, we put itis on the end of it. And in your case, you have an esophagus that's inflamed, so we call it an esophagitis. And so when Harry eats, his esophagus swells up and food can't get down it, and he feels very, very poorly indeed. So, Harry, can you show me how the doctors have fixed the fact that you can't eat food using your mouth? They put a mini button in there. A mini button? So what's a mini button? Wow. So that is now a hole going straight inside your stomach. Yes. So what kind of food do you have through the hole? Just a special type of milk and some medicine. And that's how you stay big and strong, even though yeah. you can't swallow stuff? Yeah. Now that's pretty amazing. OK, well, you've really taught me something. You did such a good job, I'm giving you an Operation Out sticker. Thank you. Bye. Job done for today. Clinic closed. And now to our lab for some amazing body experiments. Ugh! Whoa! Just don't try anything you see here at home. Today, it's your body's ticker, the heart. Zond is having a little lie down. You could actually try this bit at home. It's quite nice. But what you can't try at home is hooking Zond up to an electrocardiogram, which is what I've done. And it's basically a heart monitor. And each one of these spikes on the display is a separate beat of the heart. And it doesn't matter what you're doing. Even if you're just lazing around like Zond, your heart never stops beating. It beats even when you're asleep. As Zond seems to be illustrating perfectly, you can see the spikes and his pulse is around 70. OK, Zond, demonstration over. What? What? What demonstration? I've been awake the whole time. Now, your heart was beating when you were a six-week-old embryo inside your mum, just the size of a raisin. Your heart is made up of millions of tiny cells, and each one of those cells beats on its own. And here's one of them. This is a single heart cell. It just won't stop beating, even without its mates. Absolutely brilliant, isn't it, Zond? Zond? Zond! What? It's not nap time. Now, 
If you ask more of your body, say when you exercise... Exercise? Yes, son, exercise. Your heart will step up and help you out. Right, give me some nice big star jumps, please, son. When you exercise, your muscles need lots more blood and oxygen. To provide this, the heart speeds up. As you can see, Zahn's heart rate is much higher now than when he was lying down. Even at rest, it beats around 100,000 times a day. So, you've seen how your heart beats at different rates depending on what you're doing. But how does your heart actually work? How does it get all that blood where you need it, when you need it? Well, we're going to show you. Check this out. This is a real heart. It's from a pig, but don't let that put you off. It's very similar to a human heart, and it's a pump with no equal. Blood arrives in the heart all tired and out of oxygen. The heart pumps it straight to the lungs, where it collects new oxygen. Back at the heart, it's given a mega pump, which scoots it all around the body. And there's no chance of it going the wrong way, thanks to the heart's special valves. And if you add up all the blood each of these beats pushes around the body, it comes to 7,200 litres a day. That's enough to fill 93 bathtubs. We've only got one bathtub. And if you fill it with blood, where am I going to have my bath? You need a bath. Now, to show you how it manages to do that, we're going to cut our pig's heart open. Looking inside the heart is absolutely amazing. The muscle here is very thick. This makes the heart really strong, and that's how it's able to pump blood right around your body. But it couldn't do it without one important bit of the heart, the valves, and you can see them here. Their job is to make sure the blood goes in the right direction. To see how the heart does its incredible job, we've set up our real heart, using plastic tubes as blood vessels and green water to do the job of your blood. OK, Chris, lift your bucket up a little bit. First, the heart fills with blood. It does this every time it beats. Oh, oh, look at that. Look at it fill, look at it fill. OK, and squeeze now. Zahn's hands are doing what the heart does by itself thousands of times a day. And the heart is clever because everything's going into that bucket and nothing's going back into Chris's bucket. The heart only pumps blood in one direction. And that's thanks to the valves, not to Harry Styles. But there's one question that still remains. How powerful is the heart and how far can it squirt blood? I filled the heart. Now, you hold that bit, I'm going to get the bucket. Give me that. Quick, quick, quick. Get the bucket. OK. See okay. if you can get it. About a foot? Yeah, about half a metre. OK, go. go. Yay! It's not bad, but I think we can go further. Let's refill the heart. OK, quick, fill it up again. But Zahn Squeeze is not nearly as strong as a heartbeat. Just aim it all in the bucket. Ready? OK, three, two, one. <laughs> Zahn gets quite a lot beyond the bucket. He just didn't get any in the bucket, but I still think that's pretty impressive. About two and a half metres. Two and a half metres is pretty good, but a live heart actually beats powerfully enough to squirt blood more than ten metres. Ten metres? That's more powerful than my best water pistol. Luckily, Zahn's not ten metres away. In Sheffield Children's Hospital, five-year-old Reuben is waiting with his dad. Looks like you've hurt your arm. What happened? It's been a tough few days, hasn't it, fella? Let's go back to where it all began. Reuben's week started with barely a hiccup, but by Tuesday afternoon, Reuben got into a spot of bother in the swimming pool. Ooh, make an absolutely fantastic lifeguard, Chris. Um, maybe not, Zahn. Only real trained lifeguard should ever jump into help. Luckily, one did and rescued Reuben. Then his dad took him to hospital to be checked over, and he was given the all clear. Be you! So why is he still here? Well, Zahn, this is actually Reuben's second visit to hospital, because the next day when Reuben was playing tag in the school playground, he ran full speed into his friend James and landed on his elbow. For this week's most accident-prone kid goes to... Ruben! Ready to assess the damage is Dr Richard Mellers. Okay. He's checking to see where the pain is. 
I'm going to press up your arm. If anything hurts, you just tell me and I'll stop. All right. That's starting to hurt there. Okay. If you have broken something, what we'll do is take a little picture of the elbow so we can have a look at the bones. If there's a break in Ruben's arm, then an x-ray will show it. Can you guess who today's hero is? Well, I'll give you a clue. You might have to feed them if you've over... You're a bit hard to understand. That was a rubbish clue, Chris. We're about to take over the job of today's hero, dental surgeon Anitha. Anitha is a top trainer at the King's College London Dental Institute. Now, how important is it to look after your teeth? It is incredibly important to look after your teeth. Brushing morning and night for two minutes and to try and not eat too many sugary things, fizzy drinks especially. So how often should you see the dentist? You should really see the dentist every six months. Uh, uh, um. What? Anita, Dr. Sand is very proud of his teeth and he would like to show them off to you. Would you mind having a look at them? Absolutely, that's no problem. He's such a show off. Here we go, Zand. Open wide. All right, eight, seven, six. If you've ever wondered what on earth your dentist is talking about when you're in the chair, here's how it works. Each tooth is given a specific number according to where it is in the mouth. Any milk teeth that you still have will be given a letter. And what kind of common problems are you looking for? I'm looking to make sure that you're brushing properly and that there isn't any decay in your teeth. Zand's done very well and he doesn't have any. Very impressive, Zand. Before we let loose on today's takeover challenge, we need a masterclass. But I've no idea who we're going to practice on. We use something very special. We use a phantom head. A phantom head? Ah! Oh, come on, Zond. Really? The phantom, ah! or model head, is used by students to practice doing fillings. You start by putting in a suction tube to remove any extra saliva so the patient doesn't choke. Next, you use the drill. Cool. Attaching the drill bit with a steady hand. There you go. Fix in. Then we're going to imagine that this tooth has a little bit of decay in it. And so we're going to cut a little teeny tiny hole. In goes the filling. We're going to use a white filling material called composite. Which is set hard using an ultraviolet light. Wow. So we cover it so that it doesn't hurt our eyes. And then if you touch it, it's gone completely hard. Amazing. Thanks, Anita. We've seen just how important dentists are for keeping your oral health in tip-top condition. But will we be able to brush up on our skills enough to make our careers as dentists sparkle? Come on. It's time for us to take over as dentists. Your challenge is to perform a filling on the phantom head. The first part is to remove the decay and the second part is to put the filling in. I'll be judging you on your professionalism, your technique and how well you make it look like a real tooth at the end. You know what, Chris? I've really got this challenge. Anitha thinks my teeth look great and now that I've overcome my fear of the phantom heads, there's really nothing to worry about. Oh, you've overcome your fear, have you? Well, well this won't bother you at all. <laughs> Come on, Chris. It's time to get our teeth into this. No problem. First of all, we get out the drill. Put that right in. OK. That's very good. Hello, sir or madam. Drill. Ooh. Ooh. That was <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> OK. Health and safety, Zand. Before you take your eye out, and press oh, the back goes in and it locks it. <laughs> so, first big mistake. So we've got to lock the drill bit into the handpiece. It can fly out and then that could hurt somebody. It's a bit nerve-wracking because it looks so much like a real tooth. I kind of don't want to drill into it. I'm drilling already. What about the suction, Smarty Pants? So he's forgotten to turn his suction on. That's embarrassing. So if it was a real patient, they'd be gurgling. Um, I'd focus on yourself rather than me, Zand. Oh, he's got his hands in the patient's eyes. We don't do that usually. Come on, slow coach. I've moved on to filling. Right behind you. I had to use quite a lot, and I think I may have drilled out a little too much too. Oh, Zand. I mean, it's very clear now why people have to train for years and years how to do this. Just need to set it with the UV light. Probably enough. And, uh, right, thanks very much, sir, uh, or madam, you can go on your way. Well, I think I'm done. A satisfied customer. You can close your mouth now. Not sure he's impressed. 
Fingers crossed Anita is. Time for the verdict. Anita, how did we do? Well, you both tried really hard. That's not right. good. That is not good. On from the professionalism, Sand, you did put your fingers in the patient's eyes. I was, I, I was in a place to rest my hand. Technique-wise, Sand did take a bit more tooth off than we normally would. For the final product, actually, you were both not too bad. So what's the verdict? Chris. Yes. Oh! oh. I guess I wasn't expecting to lose. What, because you'd had such a good time? I'd begun to believe uh, that I'd become a dentist. Well, Zond, you may have felt like a real dentist, but you're not a real dentist. That is job most certainly best left to the professionals. Anita, I think you better have our coats back. Fabulous. We're on call with the West Midlands Ambulance Service, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. Jan alone can do 10 to 15 emergency call-outs in a day, and a new case is just in. We've just received a call about a 75-year-old man who's fallen over and hurt his shoulder, so of course we need to assess that shoulder injury. We also need to work out why did he fall. I've got my ouch can here. Eric in the back has his big camera. We're going to get you right up so you can find out what it's like to be first on scene. We quickly arrive and head inside to see Gerard, who's with his family. My name's Jan. What's happened? He fell out of bed this morning. OK. He was only let out of hospital yesterday. OK. You've landed on your shoulder. Yeah. Can I have a quick feel? Is that OK? OK. No so... pain when I'm pressing down your back? No. No. So your neck and your back are fine. Can you bring your head and look over your shoulder for me? So Gerard's just come out of hospital, so he really doesn't want to go back in. One of the main valuable things that Jan can do here is assess Gerard, make sure that he's safe, and most importantly, she's checking his nerves, and his bones and his muscles to make sure that they're all working well after that fall. Are you able to move that shoulder? Yeah. After Jan is happy that Gerard's shoulder's OK, she does some tests to try and find out what caused his fall. So Jan's doing Gerard's observations, and these are the really important numbers that tell us how sick or well someone is. Temperature, yeah. blood pressure, and pulse. And I'll just double check your blood pressure where you stood up, if that's OK. It's got a history in the past of postural hypotension. Um, postural hypotension is whenever you stand up, your blood pressure drops, and it can cause you to pass out. So that drop in blood pressure can mean not enough blood gets to the brain and he faints. And you might have felt the same thing if you've been lying down very sleepily and then you stand up quickly, you can feel a bit dizzy. And in some older people, that can be more of a problem. So don't move, just stand where you are. That's good. Right then, sit down. How was that, Jan? That's good. It's gone up to 162, 84. So that's all right. Yeah, so that's fine. Jan's happy that Gerard's postural hypotension is under control, so he won't need to be admitted to hospital. You can stay here and I can leave him in your capable hands. Mm -hmm. Well, Gerard, thank you very, very much. And I'm pleased, very pleased to get to stay out of hospital. Thank you. In a sense, one of the most valuable things that Jan can do is keep people out of hospital. Yes, a lot of the time, she fixes them up, ready for the ambulance to take them in and be properly treated. But actually, we've done an amazing thing here. She's just made Gerard feel better and he can stay at home and enjoy an evening with his family.